So it's not surprising that they would position Akihabara as the stage of cool Japan. What is surprising, what they didn't expect, was there was already a group that was there, right? So you have a rescripting of the urban space on top of an existing subculture, which is an interesting um, case in and of itself. I'll talk about it a little bit today. Okay, so a cross-section of Akihabara. This is from an NHK survey. Maybe it's reliable, maybe not. But if NHK is not reliable, I don't know who is, so I'm going to use this. This is from 2007, a TV show called Cool Japan. It has a lot of budget from the government. Uh, and they say that uh, about 5% of the people who are going to Akihabara are foreign. Interesting number. What's more interesting is this, right? Visiting from Japan plus visiting from abroad is 35%. 30% are there to pursue otaku hobbies. So already in 2007, you see a shift going on, even in these numbers. These are actually really conservative. Uh, there's a, a new uh, tourist survey out from the government, released in 2008, I believe. And those numbers actually say that uh, Akihabara is in the top 10 of places that foreigners want to visit. It's actually more popular than Tokyo Disneyland and more popular than Roppongi with foreigners. So it's a huge um, tourist industry going on in Akihabara. I just want to make sure that you realize that it's not a small number of visitors we're talking about, but a million people are passing through the Akihabara Electric Town exit gate each day, or each year, foreigners passing through. Okay, so let's get a little bit more specific. This is what the Electric Town looks like. I don't know what you, I don't know what you think. Maybe it's colorful, maybe it's interesting. It looks better with the lights on, but um, this is basically it. This is the Sobu line, which goes from Shinjuku down to Akihabara if you want to check it out. This is kind of the most famous image of Akihabara here. You've got the duty-free stores, you've got the computer shops, some anime stores and things like that, and you've got these raised um, railroad tracks. If you go a little bit farther down here, you have the radio market, sometimes called the radio store. This is where all of those um, parts stores, the transistor radios, are still on display today. You can actually buy theremin tuners if you want. So, like, everything you can imagine based on old technology is still on display here. So what you can see is really interesting is you can see super old stuff in the basements, in the old places. You can see relatively new development, otaku, uh, electric town, whatever you want to call it. And then right behind that, you can see the redevelopment zone. So all three levels are visible in the same cross-section. I'll show this to you a little bit later. What I want to point out before we talk about that is on um, the image of Akihabara. Okay, so this is what it actually looks like. This is what one of my favorite artists, Pop, believes it looks like. He goes to Akihabara every day looking for inspiration. He loves the place. Um, he's actually the guy who drew the art for Akiba blog. He drew the art for Moetan, et cetera, et cetera. So the fact that this very central otaku designer, character designer, loves Akihabara should give you an, an idea of how many people really are getting in on board with this whole um, Akihabara as paradise image. I like this because what you can see is you can see a looking glass, right? You can see that you're looking through and you see a distorted image of Akihabara. The same image we saw before, but kind of in a twisted, warped sort of way. It's almost like Alice through the looking glass. And what you have at the bottom there is a little shoujo character. Okay, this actually begins pretty early in the development of Akihabara. So I mentioned in about 1997, there was a big influx of um, otaku into Akihabara. 1997, already in 1998, you have um, anime series appearing that are talking about life in Akihabara. For those of you who haven't seen that, I really recommend this, Cyber Team in Akihabara. One of the greatest lines in all of anime is in this series. All these girls are going around town, they've got their mecca, they're destroying buildings, they're doing all this crazy stuff. And the president of the, of the school asks them, do you love Akihabara? And they say, yes. He says, yosh, it's okay. <laughs> That's it. You can go, you're free. So I mean, really you can see that kind of chaos and carnival aspect going on in Akihabara. You can also see how very clearly, um, like, oh no, Dan, landmarkers are animated and they're kind of um, Im immortalized in this. If you draw some of these buildings in any anime, in the background, people will recognize them. So it kind of, it kind of becomes an iconic image of anime or uh, otaku culture. This is what I was talking to you about earlier. This is Akiba blog. This is um, Pop's character here. 
Akiba blog is run by a guy named Mr. Geek. He doesn't tell anybody his name. Uh, he doesn't tell anybody where he lives. Um, he just goes into Akihabara each day. He takes notes. Who's wearing what shirts? Who spit on the street? Who bought what? Re li literally, it's very pedestrian, very mundane. This has millions and millions and millions of users, registered users. Actually, sometimes large news corporations like Yahoo will take news from his blog. So you can see very clearly that Akihabara has a sort of appeal to people around Japan. It's kind of a mystique going on here. People actually do care who's wearing what shirt in Akihabara. OK. This is partly um, based on this series. This is Densho Koko. Um, for those of you who don't know it, it's all right. It's a pretty good series. Um, supposedly true story, supposedly about a young man who's on the train. He sees a girl getting molested by a drunk man. He says, hey, no, let her go. And she falls in love with him. It just so happens he's an otaku, and she's a career woman. Uh, now it's getting more interesting, right? She's older than him. He's younger. He's a virgin. <laughs> They're both wealthy. OK, now it's kind of a hot drama, right? And that's exactly what it was. It was a very hot TV drama in 2005, 2006. Believe it or not, um, I was in Akihabara in 2006, and people were actually doing slip and slide events in Akihabara. It was like the Otaku World Cup in, in Akihabara. People were that interested in what was happening down there. They said, ah, Densho Toko, let's go find Densho Toko. And they took pictures of guys. They said, flex for me. Show me your bag. What's in your room? <laughs> it, was like, it was like a TV special about Akihabara Otaku, based on, of course, the, the buzz generated by this show. And it's not insignificant, right? So in the United States, we have like um, shows maybe get 10% of the market if it's a great show, right? Maybe. This show got about 30% of the national viewing market, right, on this last episode. So people were watching this. People were interested in kind of this new archetype of masculinity who looks like an otaku. It's really kind of a Beauty and the Beast story where the beast happens to be an otaku, right? <laughs> and people said that this is a, a new model of masculinity. If you look back through the books, or the, the, the magazines that were being released at the time, it's like all these ladies' magazines are saying, oh, you know what, those otaku, it's kind of like an untapped market. <laughs> they really don't know what, they really don't know what to do with women. And we have all this power over those guys, you know? They have money, obviously. Look, he's carrying a bag full of these designer posters or whatever. If we could just get him to use that money in the right way, just train him to be a good man. Teach him how to buy me Chanel bags. Teach him how to buy me, well, what's her name again? Hermes. Teach her how to buy me Hermes uh, dishes, right? And if you can teach him how to do that, he's a good man. So it's really kind of a lesson in modern consumer masculinity. Interesting kind of twist on the otaku image. In the 1980s, they're criticized for being kind of insular consumers. In the, 19, uh, in the 2000s, after kind of the dark ages, then in the 1990s, they're repositioned as kind of a new consumer class, which is um, possibly even masculine. There was a time when otaku was kind of like the antonym of masculinity. I mean, you couldn't actually say, I'm a manly otaku. It doesn't work that way. So I mean, this is an interesting shift. Uh, this is what um, Densho Otaku looks like in the movie. So again, you can see the layers of kind of imaging. This is very different from either the reality or pop's image of Akihabara. Very colorful. <laughs> You're looking at it from the top, kind of like this panoramic view. The thing about panoramic views, right, is you feel like you own that, that view. So not top, bottom, bottom up, like we saw before, the man on the street kind of internet image, top down kind of media, I own Akihabara, panoramic view there. OK. Before we move on, I want to give you another example of exactly what happened in Akihabara and to show you the, the importance of this change. You, you might know maid cafes, you might have heard of them. Basically, they're places where otaku hang out. Um, they used to be not such great places. When I first came here in 2004, I went to a place called Cure Maid Cafe. Cure Maid Cafe was the first maid cafe in Japan, founded in 2001. And it was a bizarre thing. They had pictures of Lika-chan on the walls. People had little Barbies with them. People were really kind of going all out. And it was this space that I could not even understand. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. 